Hello and welcome to Photo 2022's Headline Talk Series Photo Live. It's great to see an in-person audience. Thank you for joining us. And also hello to those joining online. My name is Lindsay Gosper and I'm the events producer at Photo 2022. I'd like to begin by acknowledging the traditional custodians on the whose land we meet today, the Wundjeri and Boon Wurrung people of the Kulin Nation. I pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging. This always was and always will be Aboriginal land. Photo 2022 International Festival of Photography is currently taking place in galleries and public spaces across Melbourne and regional Victoria. The, fest the whole festival responds to one theme, being human. Photo Live delves further into contempor the contemporary human condition and addresses the social and cultural role photography plays in our lives across eight events. We'll also explore through these talks how art can activate cities and public spaces. I'm thrilled to introduce our next Photo Live talk, Belonging, Human Connection and Care. Our chair today is Kelly Hussey-Smith, lecturer, photography, RMIT School of Art, and our guest speakers are Photo 2022, exhibiting artists, Uriel Eric Bridgmond, Anu Kumar and Alana Holmberg. I'd like to thank our Photo Live partners, ACME, Metro Tunnel Creative Program and the Monash Gallery of Art, as well as our education partners, RMIT, Monash University and Photography Studies College. We hope you enjoyed the event and that you can join us for the following photo live talks. I'll now hand it over to Kelly. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Lindsay. And um, thank you everyone here for joining us um, tonight for this panel discussion, Belonging, Human Connection and Care. Um, my name is uh, Kelly Hussey-Smith and I have the good fortune of hosting this dialogue tonight with some very interesting people. Um, but I would also like to acknowledge that tonight we are meeting on the unceded lands of the people of the Woi Wurrung and Boon Wurrung language groups of the Eastern Kulin Nations. I acknowledge their elders and ancestors, uh, past and present, and any First Nations people joining us this evening. And on this topic of connection and care, I also acknowledge the First Nations community leaders, organisers, educators, artists, activists who consistently model reciprocity and relationality in their work with and for community and who, you know, I have learnt a lot from. And, you know, as the panel the other night, the Ecologies panel, if people have been attending the series, um, highlighted, it's the imperial mindset erodes practices of care and relationality, and this impacts belonging. I'm an educator in photography, and one of the things that I'm really interested in is photography and collaborative practice. And I have a series of questions which I think we can kind of get into tonight about how we should be teaching this and if we can teach reciprocity and care and, and collaboration and if we can, does this mean we need a radical rethink of the way that we teach photography? So I would like to introduce our three speakers tonight who can help us think through some of the questions that emerge when we think about this nexus of photography, belonging and care. Uriel Eric Brisbane um, joining us on the Zuma from Mianjen in Brisbane. And here with me at ACME, I have Anu Kumar and Alana Holmberg. And instead of reading their bios, um, which I assure you are, are very snazzy and interesting and impressive, um, I thought that I would just first invite each speaker just to in introduce themselves to you, um, just um, tell us a little bit about who you are and um, what you're about. Um, so I might throw to you, uh, Uriel. Yeah, good evening, uh, Kelly and everybody. Um, <clears throat> thanks for having me. Uh, about me, I'm uh, Uriel, but I'm also Eric Bridgman. Uh, Uriel being my place name in uh, Papua New Guinea. Um, I studied photography in Queensland uh, at the Queensland College of Art and have been a practicing artist in a, in a lot of different um, uh, capacities uh, since then. Uh, I guess uh, the show that I'm involved with in the Photo 22 uh, festival is at Linden Gallery, um, where I've built up a, a body of work over the years um, with my family in Papua New Guinea, um, and um, that uh, that practice that we um, do collaborative, collaboratively within this house that you see in front of us um, is an important um, part of it. 
so I've been going back since I finished university and have been building, uh, not really on purpose, but more, more, more because of um, the input from my family has had in, um, in the photography, but also the, the practices of shield making and, and traditional customs uh, and, um, and, and practices that we've been practicing in. Um, so it's an, on, it's an ongoing thing, it's family, it's community, so it's very ongoing um, and has lots of interesting challenges along the way, but we, at the end of the day, uh, attempting to make, you know, beautiful things, beautiful photographs and, and paintings as well um, that speak mainly about our tribe, uh, the Yuri tribe. Um, and that, in a sense, is uh, a lot to do with me and my movements as well, being in Australia and Brisbane and, uh, and, and back and forth to PNG, my, my movements as well. Um, but um, so it's been two years since I've been back. Um, and, uh, but um, this sort of has, the work has a lot to do with not just my identity, but the identity of the tribe who I represent as well. Um, yeah. I'll leave it at that. Yeah, no, great. We, I'm, I'm so keen to get into uh, more, more of the kind of collaborative practices. Um, Anu, do you wanna introduce yourself mm -hmm. next? Yeah, um, I'm a photographic artist based here and also often in Delhi in my hometown of Kavinagar in India. Um, yeah, I kind of use photography as this medium to explore essentially just my Indianness, And I think that's something that as someone who was born in India and moved here at quite a young age was neglected for, you know, most of my life. And I think that's something that, you know, in the pursuit of assimilation, you kind of, you know, choose one or the other. So yeah, when I go to India, it's all about this kind of personal journal almost of, of rediscovering who I am and who I was and almost who I could have been if I never left India. Mm. Um, and I think I always try and find a way to discover that, whether it be in India and here as well. And that's something that I've explored in this commission that I received from Photo Festival. So, Wow, thank you. Um, and we'll get into that in a minute. Um, Alana? Thanks, Kelly. Hi, everyone. Um, my name's Alana and I'm based here in Melbourne. I grew up in regional Victoria. And uh, I went to uni with Anu, so it's nice to be sitting up here on the <laughs> panel with her. Um, my work, uh, I, I'm primarily photography, but I worked in communications long before as a photographer. So I bring together text and video and photography to explore issues close to me and my family and my community group. And my work is increasingly close to home, but um, I did spend several years working as an NGO photographer in the Pacific and the regions and I'm going to talk a little bit about work made in that time tonight and talk a little bit about how that has informed where I'm at today. Um, I think that's Great. a nice neat summary. Yeah, yeah no thanks. Um, okay, so you know we've got these topics and uh, belonging, community and care and they're, <laughs> they're all quite large. Um, they're enormous con like topics and concepts um, that we embody as well and you know these these things deeply impact our experience of the world and, you know, particularly if they're taken away. So I wanted to kind of open up space for each of you to talk a little bit more about your work in the festival in the context of community care and belonging. Um, you know, particularly the, the collaborative and kind of community aspects of uh, your practice. And what I see with each of you is that you have kind of moved you past this idea of the camera as this extractive kind of object and you're really very much using it as a kind of relational tool for, for dialogue um, and for storytelling. So um, maybe Uriel, you can, you can kick us off because you've already given us um, a little bit of context um, and you know, tell us a little bit more about the very specific work that you have um, in the festival, and I guess what belonging means to you in the in the context of that work and the story of that work. Sure, sure. thanks, Kelly. Um, well, the show to me, um, firstly, is really a significant show for me because it's sort of um, well, me being here in Australia, it enabled me to um, present um, the work uh, for the first time. Um, and uh, like I said, after two years of not going home, it felt really like I was connecting 
with my family through this work um, again. And um, so the work is, uh, to me personally, they're a lot like family photos. And, um, you know, maybe a lot of people, a lot of photographers can relate to that, um, who, to, who do work with family. You sort of, um, you know, for, first and foremost, you're, you're making, creating the photographs for the people who are in it or for your family and um, and to hold on to that memory because something significant is happening and you kind of have you have the um, the drive to to document it because you're the one who knows how to use the camera and it's like very special um, so that's kind of what all these ones are to me but um, but to my my family uh, and my my brothers predominantly in this in this body of work um, because we've it's basically documenting a process where we start from drawings and we're painting and we're, we're making work to, that does have a lot to do with our um, history um, and craftsmanship and, and um, tribal um, warfare and men's business and things like that. But to them, it's, it's really sort of like a real document of their identity and who they are individually. So it's important to them um, as much as it is to me. Um, and I think, also dealing with, um, I think I spoke to Kelly earlier about, um, you know, returning the photographs. So it's important foremost, you know, to get those photographs back. Um, and, and which I think in Papua New Guinea specifically, which has been a place that's been photographed and photographed and photographed of, um, of uh, natives. To me, it's kind of like, I know the things that I know that I don't want to do. Um, and to have that sort of care, well, this is my family. I, I care about that they get the, the photographs back and that they are happy with the photographs. And, um, and they also have played a huge part in creating the photographs rather than simply me going in and taking photographs, if you know what I mean. So mm -hmm. it's a quite a, a process that's, um, I don't really do too many photographs over there because I kind of feel that it, it does, I'd rather take a lot longer time to carefully, uh, not really prepare for it, but just to sort of, um, you know, not not take too many pictures. You know, it's like we, we sort of wait for this right moment where um, all the things are together and um, and people are happy. So um, so it's it's an important um, show for me and for the tribe, um, which I was able to send some video back and, and documentation of as well, um, and the tribe more generally. I take uh, my time to sort of uh, communicate with the tribe uh, association. So they're all, all part of it. Um, and, um, but for me in terms of belonging, um, I think that I mentioned to Kelly a little while ago as well, that there was a period where I'd stopped, you know, making photographs and um, became a bit jaded to be honest about taking photographs and, um, and it's probably got a lot to do with the word taking. Like I just kind of was like, I can't go home and photographs. Um, and but it was through the interest of my cousins and family of the equipment that I had and what we could make that sort of uh, pushed me along to start this collaborative work. But we don't sort of, as you can tell, there's paintings and works in there, so it's kind of like, you know, the, the photograph is maybe comes right at the end. So we've sort of gone through a long process of creating something else and the document is it, you know the photograph is the document that uh, that will probably last longer and um and is more you know of, of a um a just a more of a treasured sort of um uh, document so so it is it is really important um and for me uh, yeah yeah yeah, I know I like that framing of um, like a document of an experience um, because in that there's secrets as well. So you're not kind of giving everything um, in, in the photograph. It's holding something um, and you're withholding something. Um, I know your work in the festival is a little bit different to the work that you've been doing over the last few years yeah. um, in that it's positioning you, you in Australia as part of the kind of Indian diaspora in Australia or even specifically um, in Melbourne. Um, can you talk a little bit about making that work through the kind of lens of, of belonging and your sense of belonging? Yeah, I mean, belonging for me has always been a very like complicated concept for me because in India, it's like I'm too Australian to be Indian and then here I'm too Indian to be Australian. 
whatever that means, but it always feels like I've always been kind of in pursuit of a sense of belonging. So my project of documenting the diaspora was kind of this like ode to this sub community that's existed here. And I just kind of wanted to almost thank them for like the service that they've provided me and my family. Um, and the fact that I knew that this was gonna be displayed in such a public setting outside the State Library, which was such a gift because I think a lot of the other photographs that I've taken, you know, of my family, which is up now, um, have kind of exclusively been shown in galleries. So it was such a nice way to kind of bring that community out into such a prominent space like the State Library and watch, I, and I've been there and I've seen other Indians walk past it and then I can see their reality like reflected back at them. And I've, for me, that's like, ah, oh, that's belonging to me when you feel like you're really part of a community and it takes a while to get that, you know. It took me a while being in Australia, like understanding what it felt to be part of that community, especially because I neglected it a lot when I was younger and I was just not interested to be part of it. But yeah, I mean, it's, I think it's really special to be able to explore that and share that with my community in that public space. Mm. Yeah, um, and and the, yeah, that's an, that's kind of an interesting reflection on how you change and how that then changes your practice. Um, yeah. It's not a static thing. It's not something that's fixed. And that um, relates to your work, Alana, I think, in that the work that you're showing, well, you're showing a couple of bodies of work, as, as far as I know, um, but the work you're showing in Benalla is um, exploring belonging in a really different way. It's exploring um, what happens when you're working in communities that are not your own and it's exploring um, ethical questions in kind of photojournalistic uh, practice. Mm. Can you take us through um, your work in the festival through this context of belonging? Sure, you can, you can see an installation of it on the screen at the moment and I wanted to show that in its entirety because it's, it's not really a work that works in individual images. It's, it's a collection of fragments of an archive. Um, so just to kind of take a step back for a second, um, I'm part of a collective called Oculi. We are 19 documentary and fine art photographers based around Australia. And we have an exhibition at Benalla Art Gallery at the moment called Acts 1 to 7. And in that show, we're exploring seven seven experiences of being human. So we're um, looking at uh, love and fear, trauma and healing, freedom and oppression. Um, and the wall that I am occupying with James Bug is um, an area called belonging or being an outsider and acknowledging that the experience of either being part of a group or being an outsider of a group are very fundamental experiences for who we are. And so, both of us have revisited older work from our archives. Um, like I mentioned earlier, I spent a good three years working in the international development world as a freelance photographer, and I spent a lot of time in the Pacific um, Islands and Asia and Africa kind of gathering stories um, to, to tell on behalf of that non-profit, either talking about individuals or communities they were helping or trying to raise awareness about issues that they were trying to address. Um, and over time, I, I, you know, I was starting to feel a little unsure about the industry that I was participating in. I felt that I was, um, I was bringing the most ethical practices that I could think of to my work. Um, like Eric was mentioning, I was encouraging the clients to bring the work back to communities so that we could share with them what we'd made rather than being, I mean, a lot of that practice is extractive, but was trying to at least close the loop with it. Um, and I guess uh, with a bit of distance that the pandemic provided from that work and also ongoing discussions around power and privilege in documentary photography, problems with NGO work, um, I was able to have time and space to reflect on that time. I had kind of taken the work off my website and wasn't quite sure what to do with it. I mean, it wasn't that I wasn't proud of it, but it, I knew that it didn't reflect the work that I wanted to make in the future. And uh, it was through conversations with the curator for that show, a woman named Natasha Christia, who um, is really interested in the archive. It's interesting that she prompted me to look at this work. Mm -hmm. 
um, she encouraged me to relook at that the raw materials that I'd made. So I went back into the hard drives and I looked at photographs and um, video interviews and transcripts um, that I had collected and I tried to look at it with a new perspective. Instead of looking uh, for what would make a good documentary photograph or maybe what the client expected me to create or collate, I tried to look at it in a more honest way and uh, show a more holistic view of my experience in that um, country. So this is a different series to what you're seeing on the, on the screen now, but what I found was um, translations missed, so um, little moments of audio that were not included in the transcript or I only learned about later through conversations with Ken Thakanasiga, who was our translator on the original trip and our cultural, cultural protocols officer. Um, we developed a friendship and over time he was able to, um, I guess, engage in a conversation with me about our work together, uh, give me some more honest feedback about his observations as being someone from that country, someone who understood the language, someone who understood the times where we crossed lines or we misread situations or whether maybe the cultural differences would prevent someone in the community from speaking honestly and sharing their honest opinion about our work. Um, so I've called the work We Look Poor, which is essentially some of the feedback we got on, on that work collected. Um, so the I've used a case study from Fiji. We went to Fiji to talk about um, the impact of rising sea levels on certain communities and an increase in, in storms. And we were, we were trying to tell a bigger story about climate change in the Pacific Islands. And the audience was, um, the work got taken to the UN Conference for Climate Change and it got seen by um, some fairly um, influential people in terms of where the world's funding might be funnelled and how communities might be protected from climate change. So the audience was very Western and very corporate and um, we needed to tell an impactful story. So the story that we told focused on the challenges, focused on rising sea levels, focused on coconuts falling from the tree and the community not able to um, fund um, themselves. But when the people from the community saw that work, their feedback was, well, but we look really sad and we look like we can't fend for our, ourselves or care for ourselves and, and we look poor. And so what I've presented on the work as Benalla is some of that feedback to try and show that... Um, uh, yeah, like a more honest account of that work being made. Um, I'm really, yeah, let's let's pick that up more um, and kind of extend that question maybe to everyone. I'm really interested in the tensions that emerge um, when people get together. And um, by tensions, I don't necessarily mean problems and, it do, you know, they may be ethical tensions, they may just be tensions. Um, but these natural kind of rhythms of living together. And when you're working collaboratively with a camera, I, th I, you know, I think whatever context you're in, these tensions kind of emerge. <clears throat> and it made me think of, um, there's, a, there's a line in a, in a book called Together by Richard Sennett, um, where he makes the observation that increasingly in Western cultures, people think that social skills means being entertaining at a cocktail party. Um, <laughs> rather than social skills, meaning having skills in cooperation, in managing disagreement um, and acknowledging, you know, plurality and different subject positions. And so, you know, I take the, the, the view that these tensions exist in, in kind of everything that we do and, and how we work through them is kind of um, what becomes important and that working through them is highly skilled relational work that doesn't usually kind of get that label um, or get the credit that it deserves. Um, it takes a lot of time, you know, thinking and, and knowing and being in relation. And, you know, these skills of, I guess, knowing when to listen and knowing when to kind of be in dialogue or knowing when to interrupt, um, you know, are, are, are really, really um, important skills. So, um, yeah, I guess the question out of that is really just, um, and I might flick back to you, Uriel, um, to bring you back in um, sure. into the room. But like in your kind of collaborations with family, um, with, you know, kin, um, like when, how do you know when to listen, when, when to interrupt, like, you know, or when to be in dialogue? 
Well, this is such an interesting question because it's kind of like, you know, I I basically live in the community and these works are sort of um, really, really unplanned. So all those dialogues and through the process are actually the most of what happened, what's happening, you know, uh, the dialogues between the guys in the group, which are sometimes between 20 and 30, depending on what, what, what we're doing. And then there's the family of everybody's family and um, and um, and everybody's input. I think that um, I think one thing that mainly got into my head was um, with the question was, I think my own my own tensions in my own head as well about how to um, credit the work because um, and I think that took me some years to after sort of um, you know, experimenting with the cameras and, and making some videos and making some portraits and stuff, you know, was I, was I the, was I the artist or is everybody else, are we all the artists? Are we all, we're all contributing. So that's kind of like maybe um, a few years later, I decided, well, we've got a, um, you know, we have a, a group that's formed, you know, it's not just me with my camera. Um, and that, that was a bit of a, that took a long time to kind of get to a, a point where it was like, okay, we're House Uriel and this is, you know, this is our house where we make all the work and it's not just me. I mean, um, so we have, um, that, that's kind of gone well um, and it's made me more um, satisfied with, uh, you know, when, when I do show the work. Um, I think with other, other tensions, um, in a in in a village setting in the highlands of PNG, I mean, you have a lot of other, you know, as as the others would, you know, you have a lot of external problems um, that are happening around you. I think um, a for a couple of we've made a couple of big bodies of work um, around times of the election, and so there's sort of these um, external forces that are happening and you kind of got to negotiate what's important right now and um you know is it that we are making we're painting that is you know or is it that uh, we know we we've got to do that as well and 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 take the time to care about those other things that are happening as well and when we end up you know juggling um these problems uh, i think that um the other um negotiations i wouldn't say that they're I mean, there there could be problems, but there's sort of just negotiations about um, who who is um, contributing within the group and whose whose roles, what roles are there? You know, what role do I have? Am am I? Um, you know, I think that uh, as uh, well myself, I, I prefer to be more of a a um, uh, facilitator of sorts, and um, you know, um, setting things up and and allowing for the group to um, run with their ideas and what they want to do. Um, and I think that, you know, we do have a lot of fun, like um, with photographing the work, that's usually kind of the, the at the end of the, the tail end of it, um, where we're really proud of what we've made and where we're happy to sort of, um, you know, do the photograph and we go, we negotiate where we're going to go to photograph the, the work specifically, like, um, you know, with, with the, uh everybody choosing where where exactly they want to go they want to go on their land so we we go the track track all that way to go there and we do that and um so, so but that's kind of all happens while i'm while i'm just living there for a couple of months at a time and um and i kind of uh am yeah my role like it's sort of just figuring out what 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 role you have i think um that's that's taken a while and um and uh and allowing for other people to emerge from the group, you know, um, and also I think um, encouraging their own development and where they want to go and and um, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Such you know, yeah, such skilled work, and there's so much negotiation in in what you just kind of shared with us. Um, a new you you've worked with your family in India for many years and it's quite an intimate body of work mm -hmm. and um, if you haven't seen the work already it's um, it's quite tender work um, it's very still it looks to me to be very slow mm -hmm. um, you know and so I'm curious of like yeah how does that kind of play out and and do tensions emerge um, for you 
Um, I don't know if I'd call it tensions. It's it's almost so slow that it's just it's me lounging with them. So it always mm. feels like it just emerges quite organically. Um, is I've been making the work for, I mean, maybe close to ten years now, and it just it feels so natural that questions don't really get asked anymore about that. So it's it's just mm. become second nature. And there are times where I decide not to take photos, and there are times that I do. But it's it's not that much of a conversation. We're kind of my family are just kind of grateful for the fact that you know I spend so much time with them, and photography gets me there, in in a way. But um, I wouldn't really, I, and it's it's funny because I think you know maybe I haven't gotten to that analysis of calling it collaboration, but I always feel like it's an exchange more than a collaboration. In that, like I'm around just doing my little thing, just like taking my photos, but the exchange is that you know I spend so much quality time with them, and we get to have that together, and that exchange even like occurs here when I was taking the photographs for the festival. I guess it wasn't as slow, it was more planned in that, you know, I went to go take photos of my cousin and he's like 10 years old and I was like, cool, let's play basketball for a bit. And we played basketball for like an hour and I was like, should we take some photos? And I was like, cool, let's do it. And one thing I really love is the fact that I use a medium format camera because it becomes less about them looking at what the photograph looks like. It's not so much like, okay, I want to see what I look like. It's a bit of a novelty for them and they get excited about that as well. So mm. that's the exchange for me. I get to spend quality time with everyone that I'm photographing and we get to have this shared experience. And for me, that's the value that it adds. Mm. And Alana, you've you've already kind of um, highlighted some of the tensions that you, you faced um, mm. or face, um, you know, currently. Um, but you also work with your family um, and have been documenting your family for a long time and, and also have started to document your kind of local community. Mm -hmm. So I'd be really interested in your insights um, around this idea of um, negotiations um, or exchanges or tensions. Mm. Yeah, it's interesting. My family have become a little... I mean, they're kind of happy to be photographed, but they're also very aware of the camera these days. And so there is a negotiation around encouraging them to go about their normal activities. I think they've become a little more aware of where photographs of them may end up. Um, so I, I suppose I approach that with them by speaking a lot about the value of the archive. Um, as a little side story, my, my mother presented me with um, a suitcase of negatives from my grandmother from the 40s and 50s during lockdown. And we're all marvelling about the archive and how wonderful it was that she recorded family moments for a good 15 to 20 years and how those moments probably at the time felt quite um, unimportant or, or, you know, nothing particularly special. But the value of those pictures just increases exponentially over years. So when I'm talking to my own family about photographing them, I try and go down that message to say, okay, I know that you might not feel super comfortable about the camera always being here. And of course, you can always tell me not to photograph. And of anyone I've ever photographed, they certainly tell me that the most. And I feel I have to respect that. I suppose I preference their preference mostly than my own when it's my immediate community. Um, but just going back to your question about when to listen, um, there's a piece in the show in Benalla, which is a, it's a film, a, a grid of film stills, where um, one of the women that we had worked with, she has a, he a VR headset on and she's watching the VR film and she takes it off and um, I'm kind of prodding her with questions about how she feels about the film. And... Um, you know, I'd been in Fiji a little bit at that time and I understood a few of the cues, but not all of them. But, um, you know, I was like, OK, do you, what did you like the film? And, and she's kind of not, not meeting my eye. She's looking around the room and there's a translator helping out. And I asked her again. Um, and she says it's nice, you know, kind of a simple um, response. And then I ask her again what she felt specifically about her scenes and she kind of raises her eyebrows. And I just felt in that moment she didn't she didn't want to speak, and so the video cuts out. Um, 
so I suppose what I wanted to say about that is that there was a feeling there that I decided to listen to instead of push through to, to get the content that I needed at that time. And so the video ends and it was only kind of later through the help of the translator that I was able to realise that, okay, yeah, that intuition was correct. She didn't want to speak because she, she didn't really enjoy how that we had depicted her community at that time. So I suppose the message for me in that is, is slowing down and um, really paying attention to not just the things that people are saying but the bodily cues that they give you in, in regards to how they're feeling and providing space for those reactions to come um, to come through in, in some way. Mm. Um, I have a kind of hard question next, but it kind of relates. It's, not, not hard, it's kind of a simple question that's, you know, deceptively um, <laughs> complex. <for me. laughs> Um, but I just wanted to pick up on what you were um, saying about like you felt it in your body before you could rationalise it or give words to it and mm -hmm. I, I think those kinds of tensions often are um, mm -hmm. embodied but you know a lot of the time we're taught to kind of ignore them and push them aside and plough on and um, you know I think a lot of the work is actually um, you know being in your body and actually thinking about um, the, the kind of embodied nature of, of what you do when you've got a camera and you're storytelling and you're with other people, you're in this highly relational kind of space and, and you, you, you know, you, you, we are using all of our senses all the time. And um, so I just, I, what I wanted to ask actually was, um, this might be a bit left field, but like what does a good collaboration or exchange feel like? Um, we so often ask what things look like um, and it's good to get a description of, of how things are, but, but yeah, but what does it feel like? And, and I might go back to you, Alana, because you've just come back from a um, weekend away celebrating and opening an exhibition, but, but um, spending a lot of time with your, the collective, Oculi, mm -hmm. and you were saying um, what a kind of deeply moving experience it was. So I'll, I'll open with you. <laughs> okay. Um, there's a bit of left field, but... So, yeah, so we opened the show in Benalla on Friday night and um, a small curatorial team had worked on the show for a period of a year and the collective had entrusted their work with us and so it was the very first time they were seeing the show up on the wall. So, you know, our, our small group was feeling quite a little bit nervous about that because um, we wanted to... We wanted them to feel proud of what they were part of and feel that they we'd, we'd done a good job and um, thankfully that was very much the feeling in the room. Uh, if And if we go back to the feeling, um, I guess it's a feeling of connectedness and safety maybe comes to mind as in um, you feel that the work that you've done or the communication you've done leading up to that point has been heard and there is nothing secret or hidden or mm. unknown about the process. I, th I think that was the feeling, if I can... Yeah, I think it was that feeling that that everybody had been heard and that we had acknowledged that it was an imperfect process, that we had gone into the collaborative curatorial process very open and wanting everybody to participate in some way. And I think all of those behaviours had combined to create this very supportive, kind, appreciative, proud moment for the wider group. Yeah. Mm. Um, Anu? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's a tough question. Um, I think maybe for me, memories of like good exchanges of taking photographs are just specifically the one that's on screen now. I remember me and my, that's my grandmother, my nanny, and we were just napping together. And then, you know, she woke up and then just got up and I just happened to have my camera there and it just kind of, we were already connected before the photograph and then I took the photograph and then we just like lied together. And I feel like for me, those are good exchanges where it's just like, I haven't like, interrupted the moment too much in order to take the photograph but I still have that and I think those are my favorite photographs and I just kind of haven't interrupted the moment too much 
Um, also, sometimes when I'm with my, like, uncle, who's, like, he appears in my, like, projects quite a lot, um, he's he's very good in that when, every time I take photographs of him, he'd never, he doesn't, and that's my uncle there, he doesn't um, change too much. I don't know, he's just very present, but also just doesn't, he's not very aware of the camera in, in, a, in a really lovely way. And sometimes he'll ask me, like, why did you take that photograph or like, and in, in those exchanges, we kind of get to know each other a bit more and we're not normally that communicative otherwise. So it gives these like flash moments of connection and an opportunity for connection, which I really love. It's like a way for them to understand me more and a way for, mm. for them to understand me more. Wait, both ways. So <laughs> yeah, I think we understand each other more because of the photographs that I take and yeah. That, for me, is a good, good exchange. Mm. Um, yeah, that reciprocity uh, yeah. is so important. And um, Uriel, um, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm keen to hear your thoughts on this. And then, and I'm, I'm thinking also that because you didn't, you haven't returned for two years, is mm. that right? Because of the pandemic. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm due to go back soon, hopefully next month. Um, but I would so probably answer that with. Um, love and support. So with with that, um, with this show particularly, it was it was a bit difficult to to do the show. I'd have to say um, because of that, um, uh, I did. It sort of did make me feel a bit less less connected or less or more distant, if you know what I mean. It made me feel more distant while I was putting together this show. So what I what I did was I. Um, invited my mum to come down for the show and we uh, were there together and um, we celebrated there. We called the um, the family back there and we, like I was saying, we shared the things with them. So that, that uh, to me was a successful um, experience by bringing mum down and I always invite my mum to everything now anyway. But um, I think with this particular work um, that I've maybe been doing you know, seriously with the group since 2015. Um, I think, that, you know, it's it, it sometimes is difficult, but uh, to make the effort to, I mean, I've brought, I've brought a couple of cousins down over the last, or before the pandemic, um, uh, for the Biennial of Sydney, we had a big work there. And that was, to me, really successful in, in um, and we built a house on Cockatoo Island and my cousin who's in the group, he came and he's a carpenter and it, it just all went really well, except for the pandemic that happened two days after the show opened. And then it, it was just sort of, um, you, you know, the pandemic happened. But um, so I think that um, in the future, those kind of collaborations would be more successful with that exchange of being able to come to shows and experience them for themselves. Um, but the last couple of years have been what they have been, but, um, we have done that a couple of times, but, you know, having my mother and my sister, um, come to these shows, it's, and, and we just connect with, um, the, the boys and the aunties in the, in the village as, as much as we can when the shows are happening so that we can feel, feel them within the, in the show and that they're also kind of experiencing it in a way, um, that sort of, that helps it along um, for sure. Uh, I think that um, going back to the process of it and maybe six, you know, successful um, process can be when, you know, everybody's work working together. And, um, you know, sometimes I, I liken our, um, our group work as a bit of a football sort of scenario and, and it's kind of um, really good to have a strong team working together um, and and um, and especially in the conditions of um, in of the village that things can sometimes throw at you like the art is always really such a strong force that does bring us together um, and then you've got football on the side of course which you sort of go hand in hand actually um, so um yeah and i also think just you know making sure that um you know i'm not directing things at, at that much um it's more like um uh 
you know, allowing people to, you know, how, how they want to be represented. I think um, uh, one of you's brought it up before about looking poor and stuff. Like, I mean, this is probably one of the pictures, uh, this is one of the images at the market, um, which um, we kind of, uh, I think that the, in, in our culture as well, um, or maybe it's just in, um, maybe it's just, uh, I, I wouldn't really know, but I guess in our culture, people want to show their best all the time. Um, and as a photographer, you kind of, um, or, you know, depending on what you're doing, um, might want to capture something, a different kind of story that's not just showing your best all the time, but that's kind of part of, part of us as well. And, um, and, and I think that um, sometimes behind these, these images, you can sort of see there are stories like even about this one, that's a big long tea and coffee plantation that has quite a, a bad history. Um, but in this portrait, it's, um, you know, it's showing his, his, his best, his painting and, and his proud and stuff. Um, and then there's, then there is some, some links to um, violence and other things that happen in the photographs. So I just sort of let them, I let them, I let my family and whoever's involved sort of direct the, um, their representation, how they feel like rep being represented. And I kind of um, put myself like it, even sometimes my, um, you know, judgment of what is, uh, um, you know, uh, what I, how I would select something. So it's it's kind of putting myself a bit, um, uh, my opinion behind sometimes um, and um, and allowing people to really actually contribute and say, no, this is actually how we want to be represented. Uh, we want to be showing our best right now. And, um, um, and uh, that's what happens sometimes. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, and that's yeah. listening, right? That's listening. In that's, yeah. that's listening, yeah. 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 Um, I'm conscious of the time, and um, we have a very friendly-looking live audience uh, with us, and I'm sure a very friendly online audience. I just can't see you. Um, is there anyone from the audience um, that would like to ask a question of our speakers tonight? Um, the question is probably more for Alana. You mentioned before that you sort of had a bit of a shift in thinking about how your work looks or has looked in the past mm -hmm. and the work that you want to do in the future isn't going to look like that. Mm -hmm. So my question would be about what do you think the work in the future is going to look like to kind of accommodate for this shift in thinking? Well, I think um, you saw some images from Porch Diaries, I think, pop up on the screen, which is not part of the festival. But um, I would say that Porch Diaries is... Um, maybe to say what it looks like. I mean, it's not an aesthetic thing that I'm thinking. It's more of how does the work come about? What are the ideas involved in and what my role is in relation to the subject? So I think Porch Diaries is a really good example because it is my immediate community. Um, it is talking about something that I am part of and I feel every day. And I think that in the future and, and my other ideas for future work are very much about will very much involve me and my immediate experience and my family, so they're drawing on archives, conversations I'm hearing in my community group. It's not about me going elsewhere to tell a story that um, I'm interested in but is really not mine to tell. It's not to say that I don't think there's space for that. I, I'm not, I don't really subscribe to the idea that you have to be of a place to have a right to work with the community there. I think there's some beautiful examples of collaboration and participatory project, projects that are really kind of dancing on these two lines and making some really incredible collaborative work. But I think for me personally, it's going to be very much about issues that are facing me, my family, and my community. Um, is there another question? Yeah. So I feel like there's been a lot of talk about the ways that you all work with collaboration in the moment whilst you're making work. But what sort of, uh, I guess, focus do you put on collaboration after the work's been made in the edit? Like, you know, photographs that you show, that you don't show, and the space that they take up. 
and how that collaborative framework sort of works through that process as well. <laughs> you want to go? <laughs> you go, <for> me. Yeah. <laughs> Um, yeah, I mean, I guess because with this project I was working pretty closely with my community, it was very much like I asked them, do you want to see it? It's going to be in very public space. So there was that open communication and I've made it a point that all the people that, you know, I've taken photos of, I was inviting for lunch to go see it in that public sphere and then we get to experience it together. I guess it's, for me, it is a bit more of that kind of experience, but I don't think they were that interested in the edit and they trusted me in terms of doing that, which I was very lucky to have. Um, with my family, I guess it's funny, I've tried to show them photos and they just really don't care, <laughs> which is, it's, it's nice because it gives me complete freedom, but I don't think I've ever really had too much of an experience of facing um, photographic situations in which I met with that tension and I'd be interested to see how I deal with it actually and I think that's probably something that I'm going to do in the future um, seeing as like my project in India is kind of coming to a close I'm really going to be starting to explore things that are not so personal to me and I would I'm actually just as interested to figure out how I'm going to deal with it but yeah it's a good question and it's something that I'm thinking about a lot Mm. I'll um, add to that because um, I had I was already telling you about sort of my experience putting this show together was um, you know very close to my heart. Um, I got to a stage where um, I'd sent I'd sent basically the full show in a PDF to my uncles um, and uh, not the ones who were in the group because they're a bit too too hard to get to at that time with digital stuff. But I sent it to um, some uncles who were in our association and, you know, cause I did want to get their, um, just their tick of approval saying, you know, these images are fine. Um, I think cause sometimes in, within the work, there might, there might be someone who's died or there might be somebody whose maybe image we don't want to promote because maybe it's for whatever reason, you know, for whatever reason, just checking that they think that these images are fine to use, but it was mainly when I was writing the artist statement, um, that I kind of hit a snag and I was thinking something's not right about my artist statement. And I got advice from someone else and they said, well, you sound like you're, uh, well, basically they said it's missing their voice. Mm -hmm. You know, it's missing the voice of your cousins and your brothers. And so what I did was I sent it to my uncles again and then they offered to contribute to the statement. And then that statement sort of became a work on, on its own. Um, where um, I felt like those um, voices were in being included. Um, and I was going to, because I do photographs and other things, I was going to, I did write a, pe a piece of text in the wall, on the wall in, in the gallery. So I was just trying to be like, I need to um, get um, get the voice of, of the people who are in there, in there um, because the photos are still quite silent. Um, and that was something that I was became aware of while doing the statement and then we worked on it together and that was a really nice collaborative process that I will continue to do I think um, because it's sort of like oh, I'm just it's not just my story um, where, where it was sounding like it was just my story it's like I've got to make sure that everybody's included and um, and their voice is being heard too if you know what I mean so that was that was quite interesting that happened with this show um, and I felt I felt quite at peace and quite quite happy with it um, after doing that. Yeah. Thank you. And are there any other um, questions? How are we going for time? We have a few minutes left. I'm not sure There's if some that online question. Yeah. 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 Um, this one's from Alan. You have all talked about listening, slowing down, being open and sensitive, all very admirable qualities, but also things that can run counter to what the art slash photography industries often demand. Mm -hmm. Any advice on how to resist these pressures and stay attuned to your own projects? Um, I kind of came from like a background of like, maybe photojournalism and street photography. So you're kind of like forced to like put yourself in situations that are just generally uncomfortable. And 
I hated it. <laughs> it was just something that I'm just like always found it difficult to do and I was always anxious about it. And I think at that point when I kind of quit my photojournalism job and I, was, I started my India project, it was like a complete different shift. And that's when it was like the slowing down. Um, I think it was the fact that I recognized that I hated it so much was that's when I was like, okay, I, I need a completely different approach. The only thing that I probably took from it is like putting in the time as in like always having my camera around but never putting myself under pressure of having to take the photo because for me it's like it's not the most important thing taking the photo it's like the experience so I think that's what gets me through that and I mean I guess doing this commission that was like the only kind of experience of having to like deliver something whereas like my photo project in India it was very just like I'm just doing this for us so yeah um, for me, and actually I was thinking of this as Eric was speaking, is about um, building in the time for listening and building in the time for genuine feedback and discussions. Um, one thing I've found in whether it's commercial world or editorial world or NGO world is that when the timelines are really tight, that's when there's really not scope for other opinions. You kind of have to make decisions quickly to meet the deadlines. So I would say a big key that I've learned and, and maybe feel more confident as I've got more experience is negotiating that time for those things to play out. Because if you allow that space, for example, the work that I'm showing in Benalla, a lot of the work that's on the wall has come from, you know, hours upon hours of Zoom calls with um, Ken, my translator, who's now a dear friend. And it was only through those hours of conversation that we were able to tease out a really honest conversation and, and able to discuss with each other what should be on the wall or what shouldn't be on the wall and what would best visually show the conversations we were having. Um, if I'd only involved him right at the end, there just would have been such limited time for, for me to be flexible and to come up with something that we both felt quite a bit of ownership on. So, um, yeah, I, th I think the negotiation of time, whether it's in personal projects or client work is really important and communicating why you need that time. It's not just because you're going slow, but because there is, um, there's a very human benefit of allowing that time for those conversations to unfold and the trust to be built as well. Th those things can't happen in, in, in fast time, I don't think. And uh, Uriel, how do you resist the um, time pressures and demands and expectations of art photography industries? Well, I can't really relate to that question because I sort of gave up on being a professional photographer. I sort of do it as my side thing, which is I'm very privileged to be a, a painter with a art gallery of presentation and things. So I kind of, it's on my, it's on my side saddle thing, you know, and I don't really make it for anybody but myself and the, and the community these days. Um, so it's sort of my side practice I don't really um, you know uh, work to deadlines except for my own um, these days with the photography um, so yeah I, I uh, <laughs> yeah that's a good answer I, set yeah, your own yeah, deadlines yeah. <laughs> yeah yeah well I mean I went I, yeah I went to PNG I started going back to PNG and I learned how to paint there so that's been my that's been my main um, uh, you know work since then and and I, I enjoy photography a lot much more you know a lot more um, when I do decide to pick it up you know I take pictures of my family and PNG and my family and lovers here and I just sort of keep them until they're ready to come out so um as an as an artist as a as an arts practice um rather than a professional um photographer yeah <laughs> Great. Um, I think we're probably out of time. So um, could you please join me in thanking our wonderful speakers, Alana Holmberg, Anu Kumar, Kuma, um, and Uriel Eric Bridgman. Thank you. <laughs>